JBS presents a television exclusive, The Der Show with Alan Dershowitz. Myers Leonard, while playing a game, a video game, shouted out a slur. He just yelled out the word kite bitch. He didn't direct it at any particular person, certainly not at a person who was either Jewish or a woman. What is the appropriate response by a young 29-year-old basketball player to using those terrible words? You may be surprised at my reaction. So listen to The Der Show. Myers Leonard, the backup center for the Miami Heat, um, got into trouble the other day. He was playing a video game, and in the course of the video game, he was cursing, uh, I don't know, his opponent or his teammate, um, and he yelled out the word, kike bitch. Uh, now, let's be clear. As far as we know, nobody on the video game was Jewish or a woman. So there's no evidence or suggestion that he called a Jewish woman a kike bitch or a Jew a kike or a woman a bitch. There's no evidence of that. He just yelled out the word. Uh, and, and, and the question is, what is the appropriate response to that? Uh, immediately, the team condemned him, uh, the coach of the team. And I've gone to a lot of heat games when I live in Miami. I go to heat games quite a bit. And I think the team is <clears throat> terrific. The ownership is terrific. The coach is extraordinary. Uh, and, and the coach, um, uh, Eric uh, Spolstra, really went after him big time um, and said uh, through the heat office that uh, he will be away from the team indefinitely. I have to tell you, as a Jew and as somebody who has experienced anti-Semitism, this is an overreaction. Uh, this, to me, did not sound like uh, a statement coming from a young man, he's 29 years old, uh, who in any way is an anti-Semite. His teammates have said they never heard him express any bigoted views at all. Uh, this is just, you know, trash talk. Uh, I can easily imagine in the middle of a basketball game, people yelling out the B word or other words or uh, people should be sensitive and I'm not condoning it or justifying it. I'm just saying that I think that uh, the team's reaction, at least at the moment, seems uh, disproportional to what uh, the, the, the crime is. Um, I think the right response came from uh, Julian Edelman, who is, of course, a great receiver on the New England Patriots and is, is Jewish. And what he said, basically, that uh, he condemns what was said, obviously. Uh, and he said, though, it's an educational issue. He says, I get the sense that he didn't use the word out of hate, more out of ignorance. Most likely, you weren't trying to hurt anyone, he wrote a letter to him, or even profile Jews in your comment. That's what makes it so destructive. When someone intends to be hateful, it's usually met with great resistance. Casual ignorance is harder to combat and has greater reach, especially when you command great influence. And so uh, Julian Edelman invited him uh, to come and have a Shabbat dinner with him and friends, presumably Jewish friends, to help uh, educate him. Uh, Leonard himself says he had no idea what the word meant. And I have to tell you, I, I believe them. I believe him. I, I, I think it's not a word that's in common usage today. It's not like the N-word. Yeah, the B-word, bitch. Yeah, that's a word that we know. But, of course, women use that word all the time. And um, that doesn't excuse it or justify it. I don't think any man has the right to use that, that, that term or other terms uh, like it. But my suspicion is that somewhere in his background, this young man learned the word. Uh, did he learn it at his dinner table? He doesn't have a father. His father was killed in an accident. His mother has been homebound. He has lived a very, very honorable life. Did he learn it from friends? Uh, did he just hear it as a general curse word and he was just letting loose? Um, if the person on the other end of the uh, epithet were a, a Jewish person or a woman, I'd have a very different view of it. But just spewing words like that, 
I think the time has come for uh, simply education. Sit down with him. Uh, let him go to an Anti-Defamation League session on the history of the word and how it's been used to attack Jews uh, throughout uh, the last at least century and a quarter. So uh, I think that would be the right response. Look, I've experienced real anti-Semitism. Here I have to brag a little. Um, I was first in my class at Yale Law School. I was editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal. It's a rare combination of somebody who was both first in the class, editor-in-chief, and I was about to become a Supreme Court law clerk. And yet, all 32 firms to which I applied for a summer job in between my second and third year in law school, every single Wall Street firm turned me down. And it wasn't because I didn't dress well. Um, it was because I was Jewish and also Eastern European Jew. In those days, those distinctions mattered. If you were a Lehman or a Morgenthau and came from a family of elite German Jews, you'd maybe get a pass and be allowed to work in a fancy law firm's estate department or real estate department. Uh, they wouldn't let you litigate, of course, or, or be a corporate lawyer. No, 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 that's for white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So there really was uh, anti-Semitism. There really was an apartheid uh, system of justice. Even a Jewish firm refused to hire me. They hired me, but then they basically told me I couldn't work for them. A Jewish firm, because I was Sabbath observant and I wouldn't work on Shabbat, I wouldn't work on, on the Jewish uh, Sabbath. And so they said, no, we need somebody who's available seven days a week. That wasn't anti-Semitism. That was just stupidity um, and, and, and uh, insensitivity. I remember a few years ago, I got very involved in a case, a judge in Massachusetts hated Jews, and he let his law clerks know. And he always wanted to know if the lawyer appearing before him was Jewish because he would give him a harder time. And uh, he would say to the clerk, is it a Jew guy? Is it a Jew? And finally the clerk came to him and said, look, you can't use that language anymore. Let's have a code word. If, if it's a Jewish lawyer, I'll tell you he's Canadian. That will be our code word, Canadian. You'll know it's Jewish. Well, he was exposed. The, the clerk turned him in. And uh, Governor Weld, who was then the governor of Massachusetts, suspended him and sent him to the Anti-Defamation League for some training. I said that wasn't enough. He has to be fired. And I led a campaign. I said, I will never appear before this judge. And I urge other lawyers, Jewish and non-Jewish, to refuse to appear in front of this bigot. You get assigned this judge, you say, no, I'm not appearing in front of a bigot, in front of a man who discriminates based on a religion. And ultimately, he was fired and he lost his job. And that was the right thing to do. So I know how to react to real anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, I remember in my first or second year of teaching at Harvard Law School, I was teaching plea bargaining. And uh, we had a case in which somebody was offered a five-year sentence. Uh, I don't remember the specific facts. But, um, and I called on a student to discuss this case. And I said, what would you do if you were the lawyer? Would you accept the five-year sentence or would you go to trial? And his response without any hesitation, looking at me with the name Dershowitz, he looked at me and he said, no, 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 I would try to Jew him down a little bit. What? Yeah, I would try to Jew him down a little bit. The students gasped. I went over to the student after class and I said, do you know what you said? He said, what do you mean? I just said he should bargain him. I said, you said Jew him down. Yeah, that's the way we described it when I was growing up. If you bargained with somebody, that was Jewing him down. Uh, uh, I meant that as a compliment. Jews are good at, at bargaining. I said, young man, you're going to have to learn. You're at Harvard Law School now. You're going to go into the real world where you're going to be with lawyers. And that's just bigotry. Uh, you know, there's no truth to that other than a, a stereotype. Uh, I've never seen any empirical evidence to suggest that Jews are better bargainers or bargain uh, more often. There are jokes about it. There are jokes about it. People tell the only Christian joke. They say the only Christian joke is a Christian walks into a car dealership and says, that Buick, uh, I, I think I like it. What is the list price? And the guy says $35,000. And the Christian says, all right, I'll take it. I mean, it's a joke because no Jew would ever accept 
$35,000 as the list price, he's going to bargain. But so will most Christians. So will most Muslims. So will most atheists. You don't accept the list price of a car. But it becomes a Christian joke because it's a Jewish joke. Is it a little bit of a slur? Of course it's a little bit of a slur. And there is room for slurs in humor. Remember the Seinfeld episode where the guy converts to Judaism, not because of any theological belief, but because he wants to tell Jewish jokes. Uh, yeah, I, there is a little bit more of a license to stereotype, and jokes are always stereotyped. There's a little bit more of a license to a stereotype uh, if you are part of the group that's being stereotyped. That doesn't make it right. It's just a reality of a life. I remember another experience when uh, my first year teaching at Harvard Law School, the dean of the law school, uh, who was a very religious Protestant, called me in, uh, no, invited me and my wife to have dinner with him and his wife and a group of women students. He always invited the six or seven, maybe 10 women students, that's all there were at Harvard Law School, out of 550 students, to his home for dinner. And he would always ask the same question of the women around the table. Why are you taking the place of a man? Are you here because you want to meet somebody to marry? Harvard men don't marry Harvard women. They marry and they date the women in the college and next door. So why are you taking the place of a man who was utterly sexist and, and preposterous? And the dean was known for that. But also, uh, so he served roast beef. His wife served roast beef. And I was kosher. And I just, without saying a word, I just didn't eat the roast beef. I ate the string beans and I ate the potatoes. And I thanked uh, Mrs. The dean's wife for the dinner. The dean calls me in the next day and says, you insulted my wife. Why didn't you eat her food? I said, look, I'm kosher. He said, you're kosher. Yeah. I said, he said, you know, even the Catholics have given up on the business of meat on Friday. Don't you think it's time for the Jews to give up on this stuff about kosher? And I, I joked with the dean. I thought, I said, well, I'll tell you what, you know, we've been doing it for 3000 years, but I'll talk to my people and I'll get back to you. And about three days later, I was in the hall and I saw the dean walk by and I said, Dean, I spoke to my people. They've been doing it for 3000 years. They're going to stick with it. Uh, but, you know, was that anti-Semitic? No, it was just, you know, foolishness and stereotyped and insensitive. But, you know, we have to really distinguish between levels of offensiveness and levels of bigotry. We live in a cancel culture. We live at a time when everybody is being canceled and I just don't want to become part of that culture. Uh, if I'm asked what my response would be to this young man's sin, uh, I would join with Julian Edelman and say, you know, have him over for dinner, educate him, make him read a book, I have a couple of suggestions. He can read my book, Chutzpah, where I talk a lot about having experienced anti-Semitism as a young man. Uh, there are many other books he could read that will at least make sure he never does this again. He's not going to do it again. This is not a recidivist. This is a guy with no history of, of racism and a statement not directed at a particular woman or a particular Jewish person, just letting off steam. And, you know, wrong. But I, I'm just not going to get on the bandwagon and, um, and, and, and condemn uh, overly and, and destroy his career for one mistake. He made a mistake. He's a good basketball player. He's not a great basketball player. He's the backup center. He's seven foot uh, tall or seven foot one tall. Uh, you know, he's making 10 million bucks. Uh, this is not a capital offense when it comes to bigotry. So I know the NBA today is going to announce something. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be. I hope that they announce something proportional, an educational process. And, and by the way, I'm sure he's not the only person in the NBA uh, who, or in any sports league, who has used uh, racist or sexist or other terms uh, when talking to friends, when playing games. That's the next question. Should we really be monitoring people playing games? Should we really be so focused and concerned on what people say unless they reflect a pattern of conduct or attitudes or real conduct towards somebody, if, if somebody is the target of the uh, verbal attack, that, that's, that's one thing. 
But, uh, you know, for example, if a, a guy in a basketball game is hit by another guy and yells out, oh, bitch, you know, no, we shouldn't do it. But he's not calling him by that name. The guy's a guy. Uh, he's just throwing out a word. He shouldn't throw it out. Uh, we hear it on TV all the time. Of course, we don't hear kike on TV all the time. The question, really, the interesting question is where he learned that word. Uh, and did he have any idea what it meant? I, I take him at his word based on his history. There may be evidence to the contrary, but based on what I know, I take him at his word that he didn't know what the word meant and didn't know the history. The history, by the way, is a very interesting history. Nobody knows exactly where the term kike comes from. Everybody knows where the N-word comes from. Everybody knows where these other uh, terrible, terrible terms come from. Kike is a little bit of a, a mystery. According to various dictionaries, the word was coined by German Jews used against Polish Jews. Remember, the German Jews were the high class. They were the highly educated. They came in 1848. Uh, they were, quote, the real Americans. And when the Polish and Russian and Eastern European Jews started coming to the United States in the late 19th century, early 20th century, when my family came, many of them were uneducated. Many were illiterate. And uh, the German Jews apparently used the word kike to describe illiterate Polish Jews who couldn't sign their name at Ellis Island. And so instead of signing their name, they were told to do an X. But an X is a cross. And Orthodox Jews don't use the cross because it is not a symbol of their religion. It's a symbol of a different religion. And so instead of using the cross, they used a circle. The circle was religiously permissible. And the Yiddish word for circle is keikel. Keichel. And so the two theories are that the uh, German Jews used to mock the Polish Jews for being illiterate and called them Keichelas or Keichels or Kikes. That's one derivation. The other derivation is that the officers at Ellis Island, um, um, some of whom were German in background, and Keichel is a word in German too, uh, would uh, describe the Jews who couldn't sign with their name again, as Keikels or Keikelas or Kikes. Uh, who knows what the origin really is? There are other interpretations as well. Some say it comes from the Jewish word name Ike. You know, we think of Ike as Ike Eisenhower, but Ike is a very common Jewish nickname for Isaac. Uh, and so there's that theory. Who knows? It's not important. The important thing is it has become a slur. I was called by that word on a handful of occasions, only a handful of occasions when I was growing up. You know, we would play basketball in my neighborhood and uh, there'd be Irish kids and there'd be Italian kids and there would be Norwegian kids. And, you know, you would have epithets thrown uh, at, at, at people. We didn't take it particularly seriously, you know, if they threw a punch. You know, as Sigmund Freud once said, I think I've quoted it before, the day civilization began was the day the first person threw an insult instead of a instead of a sword or a, 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 some other kind of implement, a spear. Uh, and so, you know, insults are a part of civilization. It, it uh, changes from violence to insults to hopefully a society where we have neither violence nor insults. But let's put insults in perspective. Let's make a sharp distinction between people who act on anti-Semitism or anti-black bigotry or anti-gay bigotry or anti-feminist bigotry. Let's distinguish between people who act on those terms and people who just use the epithets. You know, that expression we learned as kids was wrong. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never harm you. No names can harm you. They don't have to be racial terms. If somebody calls another person fatty or something like that, that stings, that can hurt, that can be more serious than a punch in the face. So let's not believe the sticks and stones notion, but let's make a distinction between somebody who simply yells out curses that he has no real idea what he's doing and somebody who looks somebody in the face and says, you're a, you know, and then use the K word or the B word. So again, proportionality, calibration, a sense of just decency and forgiveness, 
should operate. Uh, and here, I'm, I'm a Jew, um, and I'm sensitive to anti-Semitism. I've devoted a lot of my life to fighting against anti-Semitism. We'll continue to do so. But I am not in favor of punishing uh, this young basketball player. I'm in favor of educating him. I'm in favor of rebuking him, of making him understand the seriousness of what he did, making him understand that as a basketball player, he's a role model. And if he were to get away with saying that and with no consequence, uh, many young people would say, oh, that's okay. If Myers Leonard can say it, I can say it. No, no, no. He couldn't say it. You can't say it. He's going to be rebuked. But I want to see him on the floor next year blocking shots. I want to see him back as a Heat player. I don't want to see his life destroyed. I don't want to see him destroyed. I don't want to see overproportional punishment directed at him. And so, you know, let's let's create a sense of proportion. And I do not want to see him canceled. I don't think that Jews should become part of the cancel culture. I certainly won't become part of the cancel culture. It is appropriate if you get an extreme, extreme, extreme case. Uh, look, Mel Gibson, much more serious offense, much more serious, using real, real words. And we know that comes from his background because his father uh, was a notorious anti-Semite. And Mel Gibson basically survived. He was rebuked and a couple of times, maybe he didn't get the film made he wanted to get made. Maybe he couldn't get a film made with a particular director, a particular filmmaker. But that seemed proportional to what he was doing and saying. Extreme punishment in the case of Myers Leonard would be out of proportion and I think would not be helpful in the fight against uh, anti-Semitism. So that's one view, view from one Jewish person who understands anti-Semitism. I'm interested in your views, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish. Call in and tell me what you think is the appropriate response to Myers Leonard's uh, misuse, use, uh, improper use, uh, use of, of two terrible words that should never be used in public discourse. It's time for my favorite part of every podcast, the wits to the Dirt Show, the callers, first caller. Hi, Attorney Dershowitz, this is Lynn. I totally agree with you with young man who called out in frustration, kike bitch. Uh, I believe he doesn't know what kike is all about. I think I, I said in my previous phone call, my grandma came from Germany. She used kike uh, for what I was told that um, kike meant, just like you said, that uh, with German Jews, that they considered the other Jews uh, less um, uh, inferior, um, not as smart as uh, German Jews. So you are right about that. And he definitely uh, shouldn't be punished and canceled. And this is, uh, this is what's happening in America. Cancel culture, it's horrible. And I still like to know how can we fight this? How can we um, go about pushing back on this cancel culture and get back to a, a better place in America? So thank you. Bye. That's a great call. A very interesting. Um, just to bring you up to date, the National Basketball Association has imposed a fifty thousand dollar fine and a one week suspension um, uh, on Myers Leonard and required him to go to the Anti Defamation League and learn about the history of the the word uh, kike. Um, and um, I think that's about right. Um, if the league had the authority to fine him. $250,000, I wouldn't be objecting to that either. Apparently, there are limits on the amount of fines that can be Im imposed. $50,000 is a little bit of a slap on the wrist to somebody who's making $10 million a year, but at least it sends a symbolic message. And the important thing is to have some proportional uh, response. You know, it's so interesting. We think about the word kike, and we think about how much discrimination and, and racism we've always had in this country. If I'm right that the word kike begins with the German Jews demeaning Polish Jews, saying they're not intellectual, they're not smart enough, and using the word kike to describe the kike, the circle that Polish Jews use to sign their names if they were illiterate, if they couldn't sign their name and they didn't want to use an X. You know, you think about what Polish Jews have contributed to this country. Uh, 
how many Nobel Prizes, uh, uh, how many uh, inventions, and how much uh, a contribution have been made by Polish Jews. Uh, the same as by people of every ethnic background, every group. We, we are such a country of uh, immigrants who have benefited so much from immigrants. And the first generation were always demeaned. You know, when Polish Jews first came to America, they, many of them were subjected to an IQ test, and the IQ tests were very primitive. Of course, they focused more on cultural than on intellectual issues. And the early IQ test concluded that Polish Jews were intellectually inferior. And you look today at the accomplishments of Eastern European Jews. I would suspect the same thing would be true of immigrants from other parts of the world as well. Uh, we benefit enormously. Look, um, Joe Biden got in trouble the other day for uh, saying that uh, Indians, that is Americans from a country of India, from the subcontinent, are, are so uh, influential, They've, they're taking over our country. He meant that, obviously, as a, as a great compliment. And, uh, you know, if you look at the contributions of, um, of Asian Americans to this country, they're phenomenal. And yet, Asian Americans today are subject to, to hate crimes. We just have to get rid of every, every element of racism. And remember that what you call an S-hole country <clears throat> today may end up producing the person who cures cancer. So let's not ever demean a country, demean a people, demean a group. Let's always apply Dr. Martin Luther King's notion, we judge a person not by the color of their skin or the nation of their origin, but by the quality of their character. Doesn't the First Amendment to our Constitution grant an implied right to hear the things that are freely spoken? Can you have the right to free speech without a right to hear that speech? Thank you. That's a great question. I just recently wrote an article about that. So thank you for anticipating what I wrote about. Yes, the First Amendment includes the right to listen to speakers. And the, the case that I gave as an example is let's assume you had uh, a person speaking from outside the country who was not allowed in the country, not a citizen, not somebody with First Amendment rights, but an audience in America who wanted to listen to her. That happened in the Lila Khalid case, a horrible terrorist. Uh, who would be banned from the country and arrested if she tried to come into the country, but students at the University of San Francisco, for whatever reason, uh, wanted to listen to her. Not only did they want to listen to her, but many of them agreed with her and wanted to praise her. Uh, they had a First Amendment right, not to have her come into the country, but to listen to her on Zoom or Skype or something else. So I agree with you. The First Amendment grants uh, two rights. The free speech part of the First Amendment grants two rights. The right of the speaker to speak and the right of the audience to hear. And even if the speaker should be banned, and the same thing is true of cancel culture. If you don't like a particular speaker, it's wrong to ban that speaker if an audience wants to hear that speaker, because you're denying the audience the right to their aspect of free speech. Great question. Thanks. Hi, Alan. This is Evelyn from South Carolina. My question to you is, how do you justify defending someone who is obviously guilty such as Jeffrey Epstein. He's an example. I can think of other controversial figures you've defended in the past. And how do you live with yourself knowing that this person is guilty? You defend them and they are found not guilty and can continue on with their crimes or not be punished for the crimes that they have been, um, that they have committed. I enjoy your podcast. Thank you. That's a great question. Of course, it's a question I've been asked over and over again in my career because of the, I don't know, 250 or 300 cases that I've handled. Uh, obviously, in criminal cases, the vast majority of my clients have probably been guilty. Uh, thank God for that. Would you want to live in a country where the vast majority of people charged with crime are innocent? That may be Iran, China, the former Soviet Union, Cuba, it's not the United States of America. The vast majority of people accused of crime are, are guilty. They may not be guilty of the specific crime, as I mentioned today in the uh, Shrovin case. Um, uh, he may be guilty, but not of the crime of which he's charged. So um, better 10 guilty go free than one innocent be wrongly confined. So I'm going to continue to defend people. Most of the time when I defend people, I don't know whether they're guilty or innocent or somewhere in between, take the Jeffrey Epstein case, 
uh, when he called me to defend him, he was being charged with uh, two relatively minor offenses. Uh, he had been getting massages from women who were 19, 20, 21 years old and paying them money to give them massages. And some of them may have ended up with happy endings, uh, pretty, pretty minor offenses in a part of Palm Beach where um, massage parlors were rampant and this was going on all over Palm Beach and people weren't being arrested. And I knew Jeffrey Epstein from Harvard and from his contributions to Harvard and from seminars that he gave. And I agreed to represent him. I had no idea that uh, he might be guilty of far more serious uh, crimes. And at the time, all they had was a couple of people who managed to sneak by uh, his uh, uh, process uh, for making sure everybody was over the age of 18. They presented false IDs, etc. So I defended him on that charge, and we worked out a plea bargain with the state, whereby he'd plead guilty to uh, having uh, sex with underage persons, and he would get uh, registered as a sex offender and plead guilty as a felony. Then it went to the federal uh, government, and the federal government had to prove that there was interstate transportation, and there wasn't. So we were able to persuade the feds that they couldn't succeed in a, um, a federal prosecution, but they could succeed in a state prosecution. So he pleaded uh, guilty. That's what criminal defense lawyers do. Without criminal defense lawyers, we would have no system. We would be China. We would be Iran. We would be Russia. If you want to have a system where innocent people aren't falsely prosecuted, you have to have a system where guilty people are vigorously defended. So I defend the guilty in order to make sure that the innocent are protected. Because once you say you can't defend somebody who is guilty, then who's going to determine guilt? That's for the jury. That's for the judge. That's for the system. It's not for the criminal defense attorney to make that judgment. We're advocates. And we advocate for our client. I, would, I don't represent people who I believe are going to commit future crimes. I don't represent organized crime, drug dealers, uh, terrorists. I don't represent people who, if I win the case, will go back on the street and endanger other people. And in the 250 or so cases I've done in my career, I can remember only two cases where people who I got to help get acquitted uh, or did something in the, in the future. One of them was a man who was falsely accused of murder, and I got his murder conviction uh, reversed, and he went free. And then he was arrested for nude swimming in Jones Beach, New York. And it wasn't even a misdemeanor. It was a violation. He paid his $10 fine. And the other was O.J. Simpson, who was acquitted of uh, a murder, which many people think he committed, or a double murder. And then he was charged and convicted with what I thought was a very minor crime, trying to retrieve his uh, memorabilia from somebody who had stolen it from him. But because he had been acquitted of the original uh, murder charge, uh, the judge threw the book at him, and he got sentenced to a very, very harsh uh, sentence. He's now um, out of prison. But I've been fortunate for the most part. My clients have not uh, committed crimes after I've helped get them acquitted. Uh, I would feel terrible if they did, but I'd feel terrible if I were a doctor and I saved the life of somebody, and that person then went out and became a serial murderer or did some terrible, terrible things. Or if I were a priest, and I had failed to report my penitent, and then he went out and committed terrible, terrible crimes. So, you know, we, we operate in a system where everybody is entitled to a defense, and everybody means everybody, whether they're guilty or innocent. There are rules. You can't put a guilty person on the witness stand and have them deny the crime if you know they're guilty and if you know they're going to commit perjury. But other than those rules, it's very salutary for defense attorneys to continue to represent zealously people who may be guilty, innocent, or somewhere in between. Hello, my name's Jana, and my question concerns President Biden. It appears he may be having cognitive difficulties, and I was just wondering that if he steps down voluntarily or the 25th Amendment is invoked successfully, will that put in jeopardy the executive orders he has signed? Thank you. First of all, I fundamentally uh, disagree with you about uh, President Biden's cognitive abilities. I've known um, President Biden, I knew him as Senator Biden, for um, probably um, 40 years. I have seen no change, no change. Uh, he was never the most you know, articulate, fluid person. Um, he always was like he is today. Um, 
And I don't see any change in his cognitive skills. So I don't believe, absent some horrible um, medical issue, that he will either resign or uh, have the 25th Amendment invoked against him. If that were to happen, and of course we have procedures for that, where president dies, becomes disabled, if he were no longer president and Vice President Harris were to become the president, all of his executive orders would remain in place unless they were rescinded by the then president. Uh, the, the president has the power to rescind previous executive orders and create new executive orders. If it were Vice President uh, Harris, I doubt she would tamper with uh, uh, President Biden's executive orders, but uh, it's a hypothetical. I don't think it's going to happen. Professor Dershowitz, I'm so not worthy, but I do have a quick question. Trump seeks to prevent the Republican National Committee from using his name or likeness to raise funds that he says they'll use to finance his political opponents in the party. Would you please suggest how this might play out under the rule of law? I'm asking for a friend. Thanks. Bye. It's a very, very difficult question. Uh, Normally, under the laws of many states, you have a right to prevent your photograph likeness name from being used uh, for fundraising and other uh, purposes. But in many states, that's not the case. And if you're a public figure, they can use your likeness and your name. Uh, That issue is now going to be litigated, by the way, in the Woody Allen case, uh, because uh, Woody Allen apparently is considering uh, suing um, whatever HBO put on the show because they use uh, his uh, book and they use his voice without authorization, reading from the book. They don't use it just instantaneously to make a point. They use it fairly pervasively. So uh, I don't know uh, whether uh, former President Trump will prevail or not. I think that our country needs to be reading a lot more than we are. And cancel culture is in large part due to unnuanced, unsophisticated, impulsive analysis of really complicated phenomena. So I was wondering, could you please release a public and detailed book list of things that support free speech, um, our great literature, things that have helped you, anything that the general populace could benefit from. We'd really appreciate Alan. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you for the show. And I've also paid my tuition. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for paying your tuition. What a great request. I'm delighted to do it. Um, a few things come to mind right away, but I'll do my homework. Uh, one, of course, the classic defense of free speech Uh, comes from uh, John Stuart Mill and his short volume uh, on liberty. Um, You can go back and read some of Thomas Jefferson's letters about uh, uh, free speech. Um, I'll put one of them online because I own one of Thomas Jefferson's letters in which he defends uh, free speech. Uh, Nadine Strassen has written a great book on free speech. Floyd Abrams has written a great book on free speech, and I was shocked that he was among the signatories of the letter Uh, that said that it would be legally frivolous to raise a First Amendment uh, defense to President Trump's impeachment. But he's written great books on on free speech. Uh, I've written several books on free speech. I have a book called Cancel Culture, and I have a book coming out next month uh, called The Case Against the New Censors, uh, Big Tech, Progressives, and Universities. But I don't necessarily want to push only my own books. I'll try to come up with a list and post it of other books that I think uh, ordinary folks would benefit from reading, not lawyers, but uh, folks who are not lawyers would benefit from reading about the benefits of free speech. Great question, and thanks for giving me a homework assignment. Professor Dershowitz, uh, Yehuda calling from Havistro, New York. I love your show. Uh, I think, they, and, I, and I agree with you that you know, regardless of uh, which foot the shoe is on, we have to be consistent, as you show consistency, of defending President Trump and defending Governor Cuomo. But I think the issue with Governor Cuomo is that he called on everybody else, everyone else in the same 
circumstance and situation, he calls on them to resign. He bullies them. And this, this is like, you know, Carl coming back to, you know, on. look, I have, let there be an investigation, and if not, you know, nothing comes up, you know, fine. You know, let him go and be healthy, and that's it, you know. But he's always calling everybody else. So now it's finally coming back to him. You know, the one who... So if he learned to stop calling other people out, maybe others would look to knock him down. Thank you very much. That's an interesting point. Uh, that same point was made uh, about Elliot Spitzer. He had prosecuted people for uh, similar offenses to that which he was uh, uh, accused of. Of course, Donald Trump has also called for people to uh, to resign or be canceled. Um, I'm not sure that that's the appropriate standard to apply. Um, that is the standard of what you would, what the person who's accused would have done to other people. That's an independent ground. I think we have to know what did Cuomo do? What didn't he do? There's a new allegation that he put his hand under the blouse of somebody unwillingly. That's a very serious allegation. He denies it categorically. So there's a situation where we have to find out, is it true or not? If it's true, it's serious. It's not like just banter. It's not like kissing somebody on the cheek. Putting your hand under somebody's blouse is a, is a serious assault. And should be dealt with. So um, <clears throat> an investigation, yeah, but not a criminal investigation. I would have preferred an investigation done by a legislative committee or some committee that was set up specially to investigate. But to have a criminal investigation, I think you have to have a basis for believing that a crime was committed. And I don't see any basis uh, for uh, believing that uh, in this case. But you make a fair point. Hey, my name is Mike. Hey, Professor. You were talking about the allegations against uh, Governor Cuomo. And I, personally, I think depending on how far the allegations go, it could be uh, sexual assault. But I haven't really seen a whole lot that, that goes that far. But from a business or, or a corporate or a government standpoint, who would investigate him, if not the AG, for just improper conduct? And if this was a corporate environment, uh, human resources would be investigating this to see if uh, there was any type of favoritism at play or was, you know, sexual harassment or creating a hostile work environment, those type of things. Do those things exist in government? And if they do, who's responsible for uh, tracking those allegations down and seeing if they are warranted? Thanks. Love the show. No, that's a great point. I th and I agree with you. I don't think it should be the attorney general because she's an elected official who may be running for governor. And uh, she has a history of politicizing her office. Get Trump, get Trump. Uh, she ran on a campaign of getting Trump. So I don't trust her to do an independent investigation. Now, she appointed two people who seem trustworthy, but they report to her. And she's ultimately responsible for releasing a, a, a conclusion about what happened. Um, I think you're right. Perhaps every government should set up a human resources a group but it should be a fair human resources group. It shouldn't be a group consisting of radical feminists who say that any complaint must be true if it's made by a woman and any denial must be false if it's made by a man. That's the problem of what goes on in universities. The people who get the jobs of being judges and umpires are advocates. And so that's a very serious problem. And so I do think that some kind of a quasi-judicial forum, you know, I've recommended it when I talk about the Me Too court, an independent group of people who can honestly and neutrally assess allegations of misconduct without any consequences, just so we know the truth. Knowing the truth is very important, particularly in our deeply divided partisan age. Uh, that's why voter integrity panel is a good idea. A Me Too court is a good idea. Institutions that can neutrally and objectively become the Walter Cronkites of our modern day can come up with credible conclusions. The 9-11 report was very good because it was believed. Remember, before the 9-11 commission was established, there were people saying, oh, it was an inside job. It didn't really happen. There were explosions from inside. It was this, it was that. The 9-11 commission had credible people. They looked at all the evidence, came to conclusions, and I would say that the vast, vast, vast majority of Americans credit those conclusions. I think the vast majority of Americans would also credit the conclusions of a voter integrity panel or a kind of Me Too type panel uh, that would investigate allegations such as the ones made against Cuomo. So great, great point. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. 
Hi, this is Nick from New Jersey. Um, I'm calling about your, your VIP panel that you keep talking about. The Carter-Baker Commission was already done. Basically, the people didn't listen to what was already put forth in that commission. Trying to set up another voter integrity panel is a waste of time if they're not going to listen to the recommendations of the panel itself. Thank you. You make a good point. Uh, we live in a, such a divisive age that it'd be hard to come up with a panel that is completely credible, but I think we should try. It's not so much recommendations and conclusions. The VIP panel would actually be assessing claims, would be looking at the claims that have been made, looking at the Dominion uh, computers, looking at the arguments that uh, people were allowed to have their ballots counted after deadlines, uh, looking at all the allegations and doing an investigation. Would it be believed? I suspect it would be believed by a lot of people, but I suspect there would also be people who are so locked into partisan tr truths that nothing could shake their beliefs uh, either way. So I think it's, it's worth trying. Will it be perfect? No, I don't think it'll be perfect. But thanks for your observation. It's a good one. <clears throat> Hi, Alan. This is Mark White from Hawaii. And my question is, what are your thoughts on the immigration situation at the border? And can you separate the facts from the fiction um, that's being spewed by news media on both the left and the right? Thanks. Appreciate what you do. And I do consider you a wise guy in the most respectful sense of the phrase. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. I love the term wise guy. I was called a wise guy as a kid in school. And a few years ago, I was on a Fox television program called The Wise Guys, where a bunch of people who people thought were wise would sit around and, and have a discussion. I actually enjoyed being on that uh, show. Um, you know, it's the border issue is a very serious one. My own view is I'm very pro-immigration. Why not? I mean, America is a country of immigrants. If you look at the accomplishments we've made, uh, so many of them are from immigrants. Uh, just look at what's going on with COVID. Um, the man who's the head of FISA is an immigrant. Um, the heads of many of the other companies who are doing the research are immigrants, children of immigrants, grandchildren of immigrants. Uh, we have benefited enormously from immigration and from all countries in the world. I do not accept President Trump's description of some countries as s-hole countries and other countries uh, in Northern Europe as, as better countries. I don't think there's any empirical data to support that conclusion at all, that you can distinguish the out of people depending on uh, what part of the world they immigrated uh, uh, from. So I want to see immigration encouraged. Uh, I want to see us get people as immigrants who will help the country. But I'm not in favor of open borders. I'm not in favor of illegal immigration. I think we have to have tough border security. I think people have to play by the rules. I also think that uh, it's important to be fair. People who played by the rules shouldn't have to wait longer than people who didn't play by the rules. And then there is that third category of people, kids whose parents didn't play by the rules, but why should they be punished if their parents didn't play by the rules? They were born in the United States. They can't be deported. Can their parents be deported? Do you want to really separate families? These are very, very difficult issues. But uh, for me, the criteria are twofold. You want to strike the appropriate balance between encouraging lawful immigration and discouraging unlawful immigration. If we can strike that balance, we will continue to be a country of immigrants and we will benefit enormously from contributions that have historically been made by immigrants and that will continue to historically be made by immigrants coming from different countries from where they used to come from. The nature of the immigration has changed, but the fact that we benefit from immigration has not changed. Hi, Professor Dershowitz. Uh this is Martin from Manchester in the UK. You've expressed the view that Israeli settlements do not contravene international law, but the Geneva Conventions say that an occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of their own civilian population into the territory that they occupy. So I'm interested to know why you think that this rule doesn't apply to Israeli settlements. 
Thank you. Well, the rule applies. Uh, Israel takes the position that the land that they have taken over in the 67 war is not occupied territory. Let's consider an area called the Etzion Block. Etzion Block was part of what was going to be Israel before 1948. It was a Jewish area. It was supposed to be part under the UN partition plan of what would be Israel, but it was illegally captured by Jordanian soldiers who made the occupants come out with their hands up and then murdered them in cold blood. So in 1967, as soon as Israel, in a defensive war, a war they didn't start, a war that Jordan started with them by shelling uh, West Jerusalem, uh, Israel recaptured the Etzion block. Is that occupied territory? Of course not. That's liberated uh, territory. Same thing is true of East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem was supposed to be internationalized, supposed to be open to everybody, but the Jews were excluded. They couldn't pray at the Western Wall. Their synagogues were destroyed. The Israelis recaptured East Jerusalem. That's not occupied territory. But what about the other areas? Malaya Dumim, Gilo, the Efrat Block. Those are areas that were part of the West Bank. But remember, the West Bank was never part of any kind of a Palestinian entity. It was illegally occupied originally by Jordan and then liberated by uh, Israel. Uh, the same with the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip was illegally occupied by Egypt. Nobody complained when Egypt illegally occupied the Gaza Strip. Nobody complained when Jordan illegally occupied the West Bank. It's only when Israel took over those areas that it got to be called occupied territory. The most appropriate term is disputed territory. The UN Resolution 242, which I played a tiny, tiny role in helping to draft. I was Arthur Goldberg's law clerk, and he was then U.S. representative of the UN, and he asked me to come back and work with him on it. Talks about Israel returning territories, not all the territories, not the territories, but some of the territories. And so how much of the territory should be returned, how much should not be, is a subject of negotiation. Israel offered to give back almost all of the territories or to give the territories to a Palestinian state in uh, 2000, 2001 under the uh, Ehud Barak, uh, Bill Clinton parameters, and Yasser Arafat absolutely categorically rejected it. The same thing was true in 2008 when uh, Ehud Olmert offered uh, the Palestinians a state on the vast majority of the disputed territory and got no response. So to call it occupied territory and to say that the rules of the Geneva Conference apply is to beg the question and assume the conclusion. Let me give you another example. The, the place uh, uh, um, in northern uh, Europe, northern uh, Poland, uh, that was part of Poland, part of Germany forever. Uh, the Russians occupied it, uh, Königsberg. The Russians occupied it in the Second World War. They got rid of every ethnic German, every ethnic Pole that lived there and brought in their own population. Um, and it was that was pure occupied territory. The Russians, not contiguous to Russia. Russia had no interest in it. They just captured it in a war, a defensive war, to be sure, because the Nazis invaded uh, Russia after the Russians and Germans had a pact, so it's a little bit more complicated. But you haven't seen a single UN resolution, a single complaint to the International Criminal Court about Russia's occupation, illegal occupation of Königsberg. Um, and so a single standard has to be applied. And you can't just single out Israel. What about China's occupation of Tibet? What about Russia's occupation of Chechnya? What about the dozen or other occupations that are today being protested around the world? Why only Israel? And there's only one answer to that question. When you single out only the nation state of the Jewish people, only the nation state of the Jewish people for unjust condemnation, the only justification, the only excuse, the only reason is anti-Semitism. You can have anti-Semitism against a country as well, but when you apply a double standard only to the nation state of the Jewish people, that's anti-Semitism. So you may disagree. I'm interested in hearing your views and caller from Manchester, please respond to my point. Maybe you'll persuade me. Maybe you'll persuade audience members. Uh, on the Dirt Show, all views are heard. All views are, are listened to. So I'm interested in hearing 
uh, your views on what we talked about today involving um, anti-Semitism, involving um, Myers Leonard, whether you think the punishment was disproportional. I'd be also interested in how many of you have ever heard the term kike. No, it's an anti-Jewish slur. When I was growing up, I learned much later in my life that the word sheeny was designed to be anti-Semitic. I never knew that. What, what's the relationship between Sheeny and being Jewish? So even as a Jew, I didn't know some of the words that were being used uh, to be uh, derogatory. So I, I, as I said, I believe this young man that he didn't really have any sense of what he was saying. But I'd be interested in hearing from you, hearing your experiences, whether you're uh, Jewish or not Jewish, whether you've used the word, whether it's been used against you. It's an interesting subject, so please call in on any issue. I'm interested in hearing your view because the Dirt Show Without the Wits is incomplete. An important part of the Dirt Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.